The first and second volumes of our original science fiction audio drama, The Sojourn, are now available on Google Books, Patreon, iTunes, and various other platforms. Stick around at the end for more information. The lush world of Pandora held great mineral wealth in the form of unobtainium, a room temperature superconductor, but extracting it was a dangerous task due to the intractable wildlife and indigenous peoples. To protect their assets, the Resources Development Administration invested heavily in security, from amp suits to aerial gunships. The most successful of these gunships was the AT-99 Scorpion, chosen for use on Pandora due to the robustness of its late 21st century design. This relatively simple design also allowed it to be built in situ at the Hell's Gate stereolithography plant rather than being shipped in on ISVs at exorbitant cost. The Scorpion was very similar to its heavy lift cousin, the Samson. Both used dual coaxial ducted fan rotors for propulsion, both used a sealed cockpit or flight deck, and both had vine strike kits applied to them. However, as the Scorpion came from an era when EMP weaponry was in heavy use, its basic design was already somewhat hardened, perfect for Pandora's powerful magnetic fields. They did lack active shielding though, so still needed to resort to visual flight rules within the flux vortex. Despite the increased drag from Pandora's dense atmosphere, it remained an agile craft, capable of reaching a top speed of 140 knots, and of reaching a fully loaded climb rate of 545 meters per minute. In the event of a total engine failure, there was a backup ultra capacitor that could provide enough power to the rotors to sustain their RPM for two minutes, enough time to perform an emergency landing. The loss of only one rotor while the other remained active, however, would still quickly result in a total loss of the aircraft. The Scorpion was extremely heavily armed for its size, carrying up to 190 rockets and 8 Hawkeye fire and forget missiles. Slung under its nose was a Fang 7 gun system, consisting of two groups of gimbal mounted heavy machine guns, though they struggled with air to air duties thanks to poor elevation as they were designed for engaging ground targets. All of these weapons were computer controlled, with an identify friend foe lockout that prevented a weapon from firing if a round's trajectory intersected the flight path of friendly aircraft. However, the weapon's computer was heavily limited when flown in the powerful Hallelujah Flux Vortex, forcing pilots to rely on visual targeting. This seat of the pants flying style attracted a certain kind of pilot to Pandora, those looking for the thrill of flight and seeing their enemies up close and personal. They often got to do this on the various close air support sorties the Scorpion flew, supporting amp suits and troops on the ground. They also escorted the fragile Valkyrie shuttle, guarded the vast unobtainium pit mine and, despite its heavy force, fortifications, Hell's Gate itself. While Scorpions and Samsons provided adequate protection for Hell's Gate and the existing unobtainium mine, RDA had plans for further expansion. In the opinion of SecOps Commander Colonel Miles Quaritch, these plans required a step up in security capabilities if he was to protect RDA assets. To this end, he lobbied for the construction of the C-21 Dragon Assault Ship, a formidable multi-role aircraft capable of close air support, troop and amp suit insertion, and battlefield coordination. This was a point of contention among RDA RDA executives, as the one-off project didn't seem to justify the new tooling required to create it. However, thanks to his rock-solid reputation, Colonel Quaritch's will prevailed, and the Dragon was born. For its role as a transport, it could carry troops or even amp suits within its loading bay, ready to be rapidly deployed via repelling. One particular quirk was that Quaritch's personal amp suit had a special housing on the front bulkhead, just in case he decided to join his forces on the ground. The squat, nearly rectangular frame of the craft was lightly armoured and electromagnetically hardened, but the flux vortex was still strong enough to have an adverse effect on the various computers on board. This wasn't so bad for the nav station, as it just disrupted some of the visual and data feeds from the many sensors of the Dragon. When not disrupted, this station was also used for battlefield coordination and allowed the navigator to act as forward air controller. The many weapons of the gunship were all controlled from a single central gunnery station, housed in a separate a cockpit just off to the side of the pilots. This gave the gunner excellent vision everywhere but to their starboard, but as every weapon had its own camera and they were all controlled by computer systems, this was not much of an issue. The pilot themselves were seated in the forward cockpit and used standard rotorcraft controls. 
These inputs were then translated by the flight computer and directed to the four ducted fan rotor systems mounted on the corners of the fuselage. Unlike the smaller aircraft in service on Pandora, each of the Dragon's 11.58 meter rotors did not have cyclic pitch control. Instead, the ducts themselves rotated, and the collective pitch of each duct could be controlled independently. Combined with the denser Pandoran atmosphere, this made the Dragon a fairly nimble craft despite its blunt airframe, with its 105 knot top speed matching that of the Samson. If a single rotor system failed, the diagonally opposing rotor system was automatically moved to zero pitch within 40 milliseconds by the flight computer. The remaining two rotors were then set to 150% pitch and run at contingency RPM, pushing the blade tips to just below the speed of sound. As this state could only be sustained for two minutes, an immediate emergency landing was required. The four fan ducts received power from a master bus, which itself received power from two D5 Jimmy turbines. Routing the power through a master bus meant that loss of a single turbine did not result in asymmetric lift, just a reduction in total power. If this occurred, the remaining turbine could run at 150% for up to 20 minutes, allowing time to make a safe landing. Located between the fore and aft ducts along the side of the aircraft was its main armament, racks for 10 rocket pods and 72 missile launch tubes. These racks could hold air-to-air, -air, or more commonly for Pandoran service, air-to-ground ordnance. On the front of the fuselage were yet more rocket pods and missile launchers, 12 CS-40 gas canister launchers, as well as multiple heavy guns, and the majority of the automated sentries the aircraft used for defence. The rear of the craft also had two of these sentries mounted to its underside. Colonel Quaritch used these SecOps gunships to great effect. The Dragon and a flotilla of Samsons and Scorpions brought down the enormous Omatakaya home tree and were used in the assault on the Tree of Souls. Despite their technological edge, the flotilla could not withstand the combined efforts of the Navi clans and Pandoran wildlife, with the Dragon in particular being brought down by Jake Sully using grenades and one of its own missiles. Before that though, the gunships of RDA's SecOps had long proven themselves fearsome weapon platforms, and it was only through exceptional circumstances that they were defeated. Thanks for watching everyone. If you're looking for some original science fiction to check out, the first two volumes of our audio drama, The Sojourn, are now available on Google Books, Patreon, iTunes, and various other platforms. We were very happy recently to be awarded the Here Now Gold Award for audio narrative fiction, and the fan response to the recent release of our second volume has been really, really fantastic. We're really happy with it. If you decide to get the series through Patreon, you'll access a number of behind the scenes posts, and by pledging at Wanderer tier or higher, you can get the Sojourn Visual Dictionary, which is kind of like our ode to the old Star Wars visual dictionaries, as well as access to various anthology shorts set in the Sojourn universe. It's a real labour of love, something that really means a lot to me and to the other people working on it, and we'd love it if you could check it out. The links are available in the description, and if you're already a listener of the Sojourn, do let us know in the comments. We always love hearing from people and what they thought of the series. Thanks again for watching everyone, this is Daniel from Space Dock, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.